Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last time I highlighted the fight over the peach orchard on the second day. In this episode, I show the battle over the hornet's nest as a result of Breckenridge making his assault ordered by Beauregard. The Kentucky-born Indiana lawyer turned Kentucky State Senator Lovell Rousseau was a Brigadier General in Don Carlos Buell's army the morning of April 7th. As it marched toward the Confederate position, Lovell remembered, within a quarter of a mile of the landing, and directly on the way to our position on the field lay hundreds of dead men, mostly our own, whose mangled bodies and distorted features presented a horrible sight. Numerous dead horses and our partially sacked camps gave evidence of the havoc and, which was far worse, of the reverses and disasters of the day before. Rousseau's march was part of the general advance of the divisions of McCook and Crittenden. They would hit the center right of the Confederate line and occupy the location their compatriots held the day before called the Hornet's Nest. Across the field from them were the Confederates under former Vice President of the United States turned Confederate General John C. Breckinridge. Beauregard had big plans for Breckinridge, who was to launch the major assault against the approaching Union troops. However, before Breckinridge could get his men moving, at 11 a.m., Boyle and the other Union units were ordered to attack the rebel lines. Breckinridge's brigades delighted in the thought that now the blue troops would have to march through the open field of the hornet's nest to approach them. Boyle's men made a gallant charge and even captured some rebel artillery as they made it close to the tree line on the opposite end of the field. Here is where some accounts are mixed, but we do know that some of the Confederates had begun making their way into the field about the same time that the Union troops did. But we do know that the blue troops traversed the field further than the rebels and were driven back to the woods. Buell, knowing that Nelson was needing help on the left, ordered the 19th Ohio to be sent there. Boyle and Smith worked tirelessly to regroup Boyle's men, and miraculously, they had reformed a couple of regiments by the time that Statham and Bowen's brigades approached the tree line and the blue troops defending it. At least two times the blue troops attacked the advancing rebels, and the galling fire forced both Confederate brigades to fall back and seek some protection. Statham's men halted in the open field, where Union bullets found them after a short stay. They moved into the trees and attempted to reform their shattered ranks. As they moved back, the Union regiments had made an appearance again at the north end of the field, but were kept in check by well-placed canister fire from Stanford's artillery battery. The 47th Tennessee had heeded the call for reinforcements at Corinth and joined Breckenridge's ranks, and the new troops helped to stabilize the depleted ranks. While much of the fighting occurred between the brigades of Bowen and Statham and Bull and Smith, Russo sent his brigade but was met with heavy resistance to the northwest of Duncan Field. Russo was the hinge between Grant's army and Buell's army, and Russo was incredibly concerned about his right flank. When the Confederates fell back to the safety of the woods, Anderson approached Trabu to aid him in attacking the Union line. Trabu refused, but it wouldn't be long before Braxton Bragg approached them and detached the 4th Kentucky and 4th Alabama Battalion to aid Anderson. When they attacked, it was at a critical juncture between the two Union armies, and Russo would have to throw in part of his division's reserves in the form of the 5th Kentucky. The rebels made a daring attack, attempting to exploit the small gap in the Union line, but the Blue Kentuckians were able to beat back the rebels. One of the Confederate Kentuckians who was mortally wounded that day was the Confederate Governor of Kentucky, George W. Johnson, who had a horse shot out from him the day before and would join the ranks of the 4th Kentucky as a private. He would be left for dead on the field, but Union soldiers would find him and take him to a steamboat where he would die a few days later. The two sides were in a standoff with neither side given in, each holding their positions at all hazards. One Indiana soldier wrote, they fought like mad dogs. They would fall back a little and rally again and fight desperately. I just thought that they would fight us till they were all killed. They would come up in such good order. We would flank them and we sometimes would nearly have them surrounded, but they would fight their way out. 